Wow. Hello. It's on? Yes. Uh, fantastic to be here. It's such a such a great initiative and such a great day in the audience. It's like I feel like so much good energy here. Um, thank you for representation for presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my personal story and then a little bit about how uh, the movement around me started and why it started. Uh, so I come from here. Vladikavkaz, it's North Ossetia, it's in Russia, it's uh, own republic. Uh, we were really close to uh, uh, Grozny, uh, which was uh, Chechenia, uh, very near to, to the war, what, which, which was happening when I was growing up. Um, um, we traveled from there to Moscow, tried to survive there. Um, my parents were politically engaged, working a lot with businesses, uh, they, they lost everything, so we traveled to Moscow, tried to live there. There were a lot of racism against people from uh, this area in Caucasus. So we couldn't stand there, we're not, allow we're not allowed to work or anything. Uh, so uh, we left to Finland, applied for asylum there. And after 16 months, uh, we were rejected. Uh, so we left uh, to up north in uh, Norway. We drove all the way in the car, in a really bad car during night. We were really afraid. We were really afraid to be deported. So we went to up there and then we traveled to, to Oslo where we applied for asylum. And it's a long journey. It took us five years to, to get there, me and my parents. Uh, I'm going to just say shortly about the system, the asylum system, and what I learned being like an asylum seeker. Uh, the first thing I remember is I was 15 when we applied for asylum in, in Finland and the police officers, they took my fingerprints. Uh, it was very, uh, I, I, I laughed because it was so absurd. I was like, I was 15 years old, I was really nerdy, normal kid, <laughs> never did anything wrong. And then suddenly you feel like a criminal. They also took away our passports and it's very, Afterwards, I understand that it was not very, a very pleasant thing to experience when somebody just takes away your passport and you never see it again. But this is part of the asylum system. Uh, this happened to us twice in Finland and then in Norway, the fingerprints part. Um, and uh, you placed an asylum camp and my parents went through asylum interview. And the interview is the very tough thing to go through if you have, uh, you have to like tell your personal story, you have to tell why you are asking for asylum. So if you've been traumatized, uh, it's really tough to tell everything to just two unknown people in front of you. But this asylum interview is such an important thing, it's like an exam. If you don't tell your story well, if you don't have any proof, if you haven't prepared and taken proof with you, then you have stand no chance when, you stand, when you're there asking for asylum. Uh, it was really tough for my parents to talk. They, they took them many, many years, and there's still some things they, they could, cannot talk about because it's such, so painful. So for them, it was really difficult to tell everything to the uh, people who were interviewing them. And all the time were during interview and afterwards, they, they all there's a lot of suspicion, a lot of suspicion being, uh, about being an asylum seeker. Are you lying? Are you telling the truth? Uh, also, during my time in asylum camp, I, um, I was 16 years old in Norway. I, couldn't, I was not allowed to go to school because I was too old. If you, uh, if you are a younger child, then you can go to school. But if you are 16, you're not allowed to, to continue education. You have to have papers and permit to, stay, to study. And uh, nobody is allowed to work. So basically what people do in asylum camp, they just wait. And, you, you, you lose, uh, for every day in asylum camp, you lose control over your life. You have no, uh, you have no future, you have no, um, you cannot do anything. You cannot uh, re engage yourself in some activities. Uh, everything is forbidden. Uh, and for me, uh, I got really depressed when I was in the asylum camp. I, I realized that I have no future. And because of the Dublin regulation, since we applied for asylum in Finland, and then we applied again in Norway, we had no ch chances in Norway, because once you applied for asylum in one country, in Europe, you haven't, 
the, your application doesn't matter in other countries. So no matter how many times you tell your story, it doesn't matter in other countries. So I very early realized that this is, I'm a part of this big asylum system and there's no, no way out of it. I, th there is no hope. So when, when I was 16 years old, I basically kind of lost hope in having a future, in dreaming something, because I realized that we just, that many, I saw many other asylum seekers just traveling from one place to another, trying to, they're so panic striking, so afraid of being deported out of the country, they, that, and they don't get, we didn't get any psychological help. So you kind of, you are in a really bad place when you, when you live in an asylum camp, and nobody, there's nobody to talk to, and I was, there were no one uh, my age, so I couldn't talk to uh, my parents. I saw how, how difficult, how, how, how they struggled emotionally. So I early real, realized that I couldn't share the, the bad things, the bad feelings in me with them, because then they would be even more sad. So I, I wrote diaries a lot. My, my diary I, I wrote, wrote for, many, for many years. It kind of helped me to get through this. Uh, Ooh, yeah, it's supposed to be like this. Uh, when I was 18 years old, our application was rejected, and by that time, I I managed to get into school, uh, and I was I got some friends, and I was really really angry at myself that we were rejected, and that we uh, and that I allowed myself to uh, love my friends, to to love this country, to kind of get used to to, to life here, I, because I knew from the start that we would be uh, we, we we didn't have any chance, but but you still have a little bit of hope. Uh, and I told my friends, sorry, we are we are rejected. We're probably going to be deported. We are really afraid to be deported. So we we'll probably go to another country. And my friends, I, I, was go, I thought that they were going to be like, okay, so you have to go, goodbye. But they were, they were like angry with me, and I, and I couldn't understand this anger. And they said, but you are part of our lives, why should you go? You're part of this country, you belong here, you're integrated here, you speak the language, everything, you, uh, and you are our friend. And I was 18 years old by the time, and it suddenly hit me. Wow, so this is what friendship is, like this concept of friendship. This is how it works. I never experienced it before. I was so used to travel from one country to another, um, get new friends, lose them and get to another. That's, that's what you do when you are a refugee. But then suddenly, wow, I, could, uh, I had friends. I, I, I couldn't leave them, so I stayed. And I stayed in the country. It was, uh, um, it was September, it was autumn 2003. Uh, and I lived without papers for, for many years. Uh, and what you, how is it to live without papers? I never knew anything about it. And uh, when, when I started my journey, when I was a little girl, I would never, never think that I'm going to be uh, living illegally in the country. It sounded so, so bad. But suddenly, you never know how life is going to be, and suddenly you just are there and living illegally. Um, I don't think it's, it's a good thing to live without papers. It's, it's pretty scary, uh, actually. Uh, I was uh, lucky and I can manage to avoid some bad things that happened to me, but I also see uh, in the aftermath of that, I see that many people are not that lucky. Uh, because if you, if, when you don't have any papers, you don't have any, any rights, basically. You don't have any support. Um, I, I, I thought, okay, what if, um, what if I saw a crime on the street? Would I be able to, uh, to report it to police if I was a witness? No, I probably would not, because police then would just deport me. I also thought a lot about how it is it to be a woman. Uh, what if someone rapes me and I'm in the country illegally? Can I go to the police and tell it? Not sure. Uh, and also, when you are in, in the country illegally, it's very easy to use you for work uh, and for other purposes. You, have, you kind of have nobody who protects you. And I also worried a lot about my parents, because I thought, what if they die? My father had a heart attack. What if my father dies? How can I bury a person who doesn't exist? And the th last thing is that when you are illegally in the country, you have no freedom of speech. Because if you tell someone, <laughs> if you just raise your voice, uh, you get noticed, and then it's easier for police to find you and deport you. So we have many, many thousands of people living in Europe today who have no voice, have no basic human rights. Um, 
I managed to get into the university, uh, and that's the thing, because when you're living illegally, you have to try, take, you, you, you are basically criminal, but I wanted all the time try, try to make a right decision. And how do you find a right decision when you are basically are, uh, in the wrong situation? Uh, so when I applied for university, I wrote honestly to them and said, I have no papers, but my dream is to study, I really want to study. Uh, and I got accepted. <laughs> Uh, so I went to the univers university five years, I, I finished my degrees um, and I was thinking, okay, what now? I have several job offers, I speak fluent, I, I love this country for me, five years, seven years in the same place is like an, an eternity because I've never stayed anywhere that, for, for that long. Uh, and um, so I decided to write a book about all this. Uh, and I decided to write a book because... Um, not because I was uh, angry with the asylum system. I wanted to write a book to tell how it is, to tell my story, to tell personal story, how it is to be in this situation. Um, asylum seeker uh, and um, living illegally. Uh, because all I saw in the news was that uh, you, uh, you only saw like this short notices about uh, criminal asylum seekers deported. There were only numbers, there were no faces. So I wanted to write a book and I thought uh, well, if 10 people read my book and kind of change their perception of uh, asylum seekers, then I achieved my goal. Uh, so uh, the book became like this. It's called The Legal in Norwegian. I also got an award as uh, Norwegian of the Year. The same, the same autumn the book was published. Uh, and about uh, three, four months after the book was published, I was arrested after I was giving a talk. Uh, I was arrested at the School of Nansen, a great refugee and UN hero. Uh, and um, there were five policemen, they surrounded me and they just threw me in the car. Uh, and they uh, drove me to um, this place, it's uh, asylum jail. Uh, the authorities doesn't call it asylum jail, they call it uh, like the deportation camp. It's where you, they put you before they deport you. And you're not supposed to be there for more than one day, but many people stay there maybe even for one year. Uh, and this place in Norway has been criticized by the UN's uh, torture committee, and it's not the only, it's not the most bad place, uh, bad asylum jail in Europe. There are many other places like this. Um, and it's, it's, it's a jail. You, you, when you get there, you get body searched, you have to stand totally naked, you're locked there during, uh, during night, you have no you know, Wi Fi, you know, you're, not, uh, no, you're not connected to the world. Uh, and I also noticed one thing is that in the kitchen, in the uh, area, there were not, no, no sharp things, uh, no sharp knife, nothing. Everything was in plastic. And there's a reason why is it like this. Um, so I was, I was having a lot of anxiety when I was there. This is basically the picture I saw every day out of my window, like, um, I don't know, maybe like every 10 minutes. Only planes that leave, never planes that, that land. Uh, and it gave me a lot of anxiety because I, was, I didn't get any psychological help. Uh, I was really afraid of being deported. Uh, to, not because I was afraid what is waiting for me there, because uh, I was afraid because uh, I was... Uh, Norway was my home. This is where I grew up. I, why, why should I be deported from everything that defined me and everything I loved? Um, so at, at the end, I was deported, and um, it was the worst feeling in my life. I spent three years of my life trying to like recover from all these things um, because I felt like an like an animal. Uh, you, you 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 lose everything. You lose all control, and you have no. They just put you on the plane against your will, and just you just have to fly. Uh, during this time, when I was in jail, the, the most magical thing happened. There was uh, two, two days after my arrest, like the, from the second of my arrest, there was so, there, there was the, the huge movement happened. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were huge demonstrations everywhere. And during two days, there were 90,000 people in the Facebook group, which was uh, um, made for just during my arrest. So it was 90,000 people, it was more people than in the Prime Minister's Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I learned about it because one of the policemen at the, the jail, he's like, did you, did you see the Facebook? And I was like, I don't have any access to the internet. <laughs> there are like 90,000 people there. Wow, how did this happen? Who are those people? Um, so well, a lot of demonstrations, this is one of the main demonstrations, a lot of people uh, engaged in this uh, and 
yeah. What happened is was the new law, um, and after I was deported, after three months, I was allowed to uh, to come back to Norway. Um, it was a lot of press. It was like it was crazy. For two weeks, there was nothing in the press that just me. Um, yeah, I got a little bit tired of that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the movement. Why? Why? why how the hell did that happen? <laughs> Uh, and I, I, it took me a while to, to try to understand what happened. And I think the most important thing is this, that I told a personal story. This, uh, many people who read my book, he, they, they thought that that could have been me. I, I was very personal in my book. I used my diaries. I, uh, they could identify uh, themselves with me. And I, I wrote about like, you, all, peop all things that we all people, about love and belonging and happiness and uh, about my friends. <laughs> I wrote about all these things, like I was, I was just a normal person, even though I was living in the country illegally. Uh, the second thing is, um, I ask myself, what is it, what is it I want? What, what is my, my goal? Uh, and I, I think the, the reason I succeed, or we succeed with all those people in Norway, is because I, um, I was not angry. I, was not, I could have been really, really angry with the asylum system, but I was not. I was so grateful to people in the country who helped me, who cared, who really saw me as a person and not just like some uh, criminal asylum seeker. Uh, so I think it's important to, to, act, to, to, think what, to act out of love when you try to create a change. Uh, it's not, don't like... Don't, don't yell at people. Uh, it's very much more effective to, to motivate and to tell the good story, to, to inspire than to, to say, oh, you're doing a bad thing. Uh, and that's uh, one of the examples of what, uh, it's an article in, uh, in Norway, it's about, and it says, meet children who are going to be deported. Because one of the consequences of my case is that uh, the, the, discourse about, the discussion about asylum seekers changed. And people started to focus not on numbers, but on the faces and who are these people. And it says, like, these kids are just playing football, they go to a kindergarten, they, they are, like, many of them are born here. So it's more, much more personal perspective to show, and it was much more effective. Um, the other thing is that I think it's important <laughs> to dream big. And people... People thought I was crazy. When I was trying to, to, when I was telling them to politicians and lawyers and NGOs that I'm writing this book, they looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, why, why do you want to do this? Um, so, and I got rejected by several publishers. They said, oh, sorry, I don't have time to, to publish you. Uh, but in the end, I found someone who believed in me. Um, and I think the reason it became such a big movement is because... Um, I didn't, uh, I, I could have written a small article about my life as an illegal immigrant. Uh, I could have, uh, I could have write my, wrote my book anonymously. But I decided to like uh, go for it and, like, all, like all or nothing. Uh, and that, no, people noticed that and people respect when you take big risks. And I think big risks are, yeah, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to win big, you have to play big as well. Um, the enemies, it's, it's a very uh, negative word, but I, a strong word, but I, I, I keep it there. Um, what happened is that the prime minister in the country were really against my, my, my case and my book and uh, wanted to get rid of me. Uh, but people were really, really supportive and were on my side, many of them. Uh, so what happened is that suddenly there was a third party. There was this... Um, uh, technology magazine that said, oh, we, but we can hire her. Uh, and everybody was like, how, oh, what's happening? And they never, they had never ever meet me. They just saw me in the news uh, two days after uh, the arrest and they're like, okay, we can hire her. So what happened is that it became a compromise. Like the prime minister could, could say, okay, yes, we can create some, uh, some change in the law and then you can stay. So it's important to also understand what is it the other party thinking? What are, what, what are people who are against you, what are they thinking? And how can you help them to change something? Yes, and in my case, it's also, the, there's been almost no talk about uh, refugees and, and illegal, 
and illegal immigrants uh, in Norway. They're like, it was happening, many people knew about it, but it felt so helpless, nobody, nobody could do something. So uh, when my book was published and when I was arrested, it was like the tipping point, because then it started to just roll down from there. It was really hard to push it to get attention, and then it just started. And one of the things that happened during my, uh, my arrest is that uh, somebody filmed me, like with a really bad video, bad camera, phone camera, but this short video, was, it went viral just during uh, uh, the first nights, the first hours of my arrest, and it kind of helped people to also understand what is happening. So I think it's, uh, if to create change, one should like, uh, ask yourself, so what is, you have to like find the right moment, find the right timing, and sometimes it's almost important, impossible to plan it, but um, you have to follow with, with the news. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that do the right thing, because many people ask me afterwards, do you regret that you wrote a book? And I always say no, because I, I was really, really honest with myself and asked myself, is it, this is, is, do I want to do this? Why do I want to do this? Uh, and nobody can give you this answer. You have this answer in yourself, and you have to like, be really, really honest with yourself. Uh, because it, it, it is going to be tough. It was it a was really tough uh, time, and, uh, um, and it's difficult sometimes to talk about it. But I, I, in the end, I feel like it was the, most, the, best, the best decision I, I could make at this, at this point. And this is the test question I always ask myself when I try to start a new project or want to do something. What is worth doing even if you know you will fail? Um, so I think this is all. I want to uh, end this talk with, uh, with a quote, I th which is, I think is fantastic, with Margaret Mead, who's a great uh, writer and anthropologist. You've probably heard this quote before, but I think it's... Uh, it's, it's, it shows what, what you can do when you are just a small group of, of people. Thank you.